ನಮಶ್ರೀಯತಿಜಾಯ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದಸೂರ ಸಚ್ಚಿತ್ಸುಖಸ್ವಾಯ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನೇತಾಪಹಾರಿಣೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಟು ಐ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಐ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಗುಲ್ಶನ್ ಶರ್ಮಾಜಿ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಸುದೀಪ್ ಮಧುಮಜಾರ್ ಮಜುಮದಾರ್ಜಿ ಫಾರ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಇನ್ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ಸೀಕ್ವೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ ಆಫ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯೂತ್ ಎಂಪವರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಮೆನಿ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಏಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಮೆಥಡಾಲಜಿ ದ ರೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟೀಚರ್ ದ ರೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಬಟ್ i am i wanted to focus on one particular thing which i feel is very essential at this this juncture uh, which is the role of concentration as uh, sudip babu just said swami vivekananda considered concentration to be the key to uh, success in education uh, swami vivekananda he has praised concentration and pointed out the importance of concentration in many different uh, on many different occasions in the complete works you will find um, one part i just wanted to read which struck me was he says how has all knowledge in the world been gained but by concentration of the powers of the mind the world is ready to give up its secrets if only we know how to knock how to give it the necessary blow the strength and force of the blow come through concentration there is no limit to the power of the human mind the more concentrated it is the more power is brought to bear on one point that is the secret now why i chose this particular quotation is recently i was reading about um an a very nice article about the life and work of uh, von neumann one of the greatest uh, scientific minds of the 20th, 20th century uh, he was here in the united states um, tremendous mind i mean his his contributions are across multiple fields now in that uh, article there was a lot of biographical information how he would work and uh, they described how he would concentrate intensely on a particular subject and master it very fast and make breakthrough discoveries in that subject and then the key thing was he believed von neumann the scientist he believed that um, he every problem could be solved if one could concentrate hard enough on it now this is almost exactly swami vivekananda's language i was Im- immediately reminded of this uh, observation by swami vivekananda that the secret to all knowledge lies in in concentration swami vivekananda said that the difference between an ordinary person and a great person lies in the degree of concentration um i myself have seen on various occasions i love visiting universities educational institutions and watching scholars professors students uh, working and i have seen this thing one thing common that uh, it is concentration which makes the difference between a successful student and not so successful student between a successful teacher scholar and not so successful scholar or teacher um i have visited um, uh, some of the best campuses on uh, in in india i used to go to iit kanpur to give talks there and i preferred to stay on campus go to the library and watch students at work recently i was um privileged to spend a, a one year at harvard university last year 1920 uh, 2019 and 2020 i was uh, for nearly one year i was at harvard university and there also i did the same thing i watched um, students at work scholars at work one thing i noticed common across the world in the top institutes wherever i've seen um it is this power of concentration the best students the best scholars and uh, and uh, professors they have this unique ability to uh focus on something to cut out all distractions and to hold that focus steady on that subject this is what i want to talk about swami vivekananda gets gave so much importance to this and uh, in this day and age what is the problem the challenge to concentration 
and what are the ways in which we can face those challenges and overcome them and develop the power of concentration. I think this is one thing, one area where the youth today across the world, especially in India, we need to focus. Um, we have a tremendous, what is called a human capital boom in, in India, the um, young population there. And that is the greatest resource. Um, Dr. Gulshan uh, Sharmaji knows, Shudhi Babu also knows that, especially when you come out of India and you look at the advanced countries in the, in the world, in Europe, in America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you see the uh, importance of human capital. Uh, sometimes we think that when a population can be a problem, overpopulation can be a problem as we see in India, but we see the importance of human capital. You see what the achievements of Indians in all these countries. Uh, the Indian diaspora is one of the most well-to-do, highly accomplished, highly regarded sections of the population wherever Indians have gone. So the advantage of, uh, uh, of the of population, human resources, you can see in these countries. And the key to it, the key to it, I believe it lies here in the power of, of uh, concentration, to key to empowering our younger generation. Problem. Right now, uh, there is this documentary you can you can all watch and i highly recommend that you watch it it's called the social dilemma um people here are watching it also and i saw it um uh, and it is about the harmful effects of social media on concentration uh, on the lives of people um, especially young people so what has happened is that uh, the most common social media platforms like Facebook and other things, um, how they are being used and what is the effect on the psychology of people who use these social uh, platforms? That's the topic of this uh, very interesting documentary. Um, the, it, they're talking about how, you know, when we see the uh, internet today, so many websites, so much is on offer, wonderful content, uh, audio, video, everything. And what strikes us is it is uh, all free. All this tremendous content is there which can engage you day and night. It's all free, easily available. There is a saying, uh, nothing is free. If a product is free, then uh, you must realize that you are the product. Uh, if you're getting something for free, then what is being sold there is you are being sold there. How are we being sold there? It seems that uh, in the in Silicon Valley in the last 20 years or so, they, they realized this fact that they, people cannot compete in the internet on the basis of content alone. There's so much content there. No matter how nice you make you make your web, web page, no matter how nice you make your uh, YouTube channel, whatever you do, uh, there is so much com uh, competition there, so much content there. So uh, how can we grab your attention that became the uh, new area of research uh, so they call it the attention economy and why they're interested in grabbing your attention is of course money at the bottom of it is all money all these uh, uh, outlets the media channels and all they 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 need money from sponsors and the corporates they give advertisements and uh, based on that the, these uh, content providers generate revenue. For them, it is very essential to grab your attention. So over the years, these platforms have developed to uh, grab our attention. The psychology of it is very interesting. Uh, people of earlier generation, uh, Dr. Sharma or uh, Shuri Babu or I, we will feel that uh, technology is neutral. It we all always hear this. Our uh, parents, uh, uncles and aunties will tell us technology is not to blame. It is the human being who is to blame. Technology is neutral. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. But that's not true. What we don't realize, people of our generation, is they point it out that uh, uh, this new technology is not neutral. It is being designed and redesigned continuously. See, the phone which we had, telephone landline, which we had, um, 
even now it's there on my desk it is covered with dust the land telephone landline um that was this it was stable technology it, it remained in the same form a phone would come into our house and the same we, we all from childhood we grew up seeing the same telephone with a rotary dial same instrument maybe 20 years it would stay and it would be replaced by another one like it that's it but the phone that we use today the smartphone even i have got one so what is happening is that there are these very smart people in silicon valley many of them indians they are spending their days and nights improving and changing this phone continuously changing you will see your phone is continuously updating new software is coming and new apps are coming it is changing not only the hardware is changing every few years you replace this phone but every day uh, the software of the phone is being upgraded new things are being downloaded automatically even if you don't know it many of these upgrades many of these changes are designed to capture our attention so in this social dilemma this uh, documentary has shown how uh, these uh, apps social media platforms are programmed continuously to catch our attention they can track us they know what we are browsing so they all of it is to not for any evil intention but to sell their products so um, for example simple thing on facebook if you send a message to somebody you will find a little dot 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 is coming that the other person is responding when the other person is typing at that time they will show you that the other person is typing so that just generates an anticipation in our mind we are waiting for the reply for that little period of time our attention is caught there again and again you will see the um, phone little ping will be there little ting will be there some sound will come little vibration will be there on purpose on purpose why and um, they discovered that uh, when you give this once in a while um, little message will come little advertisement will come and we try and take a look at the phone this taking a look at the phone this micro diversion of attention we become trained to that and there is a neuroscience this um, uh, they, they have gone into it that just as we get a little burst of uh, dopamine in in the brain which gives us a little tiny little burst of pleasure uh, whenever we do something which we like the phone trains us for that so it becomes like a like a little bit of an addiction not an intense addiction like drug drug addiction in that case it would be banned but a small addiction which seems innocent but still is a very strong addiction you notice how all of us have been trained over time to just look at the phone again and again hundreds of times throughout the day we take a look, look at the phone just for a few seconds so it is very damaging for our attention it's very damaging for concentration concentration requires paying attention to something unbroken attention for a chunk of time like our whole habit is to look here and there uh, is to look at the phone again and again go to on social media and look at uh, our posts look at updates not related to our current work it has a very bad effect on attention um, and we it becomes a habit which is very difficult to break a very good test is something common to people all over the world now if you take away your phone if you switch it off immediately you feel a little uneasy you feel a little that little uneasiness is because we have been trained we have been addicted to that phone i was hearing that people here in uh, columbia university in new york ivy league universities uh, uh, they are watching this documentary social dilemma and many of them have vowed to go off social media altogether students young students in the top universities in america i don't know how many will be able to do it but it just shows the scale of the problem i saw recently someone in a harvard university they are organizing watch parties that means the students will get together and watch this documentary um so the point here is um daniel goldman who is a psychologist journal, journalist who wrote the famous book on emotional intelligence eq he has re recently written a book on concentration and this book is called focus daniel goldman focus he says that over the years i have been hearing these complaints about the loss of concentration especially among young people students 
I've heard it from parents. I've heard it from teachers. I've heard it from the students themselves. I've heard it from corporate leaders who are hiring the uh, youngsters who are coming out of universities and they find this problem, loss of productivity, uh, inability to concentrate. So he said, that's why it prompted me to write this book. Now, I'll say a few things about what the, the findings of this Daniel Coleman, uh, Daniel Goldman's findings, which he has put in the book, focus. Um, one thing he says is, we must make a distinction between this wandering mind and reflective thinking. So it's not that we do not focus. It is not that we are not using our minds. Our minds are in fact overused. We're constantly chattering. So minds are going from one thought to another thought, being distracted a little bit by computer or phone, again going back to our work, again thinking of something else. So this is called wandering mind. And he says, this is the enemy of concentration. So concentration is when you pick up a certain thread of thought, a certain aspect which you want to think about and hold on to it. When distractions come, you come back to that. You uh, disengage with the distraction, not go to the phone, not go to the computer, not check your phone again. Go back, you come back to your focus of work or your thought and go on with that. Let me give you an example. Uh, Few years back, I heard a talk on Vedanta given by another monk, a friend of mine, who's a noted mathematician. Some of you may know him, Mahan Maharaj. Uh, yeah, he got the Infosys Award, Bhatnagar Award. I think first time monk has been given <laughs> these awards. Uh, he has been borrowed by Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR in Mumbai. They asked Belurmat that can we borrow your monk for a few years for research work uh, in you know mathematics in, in uh, topology actually that's his area anyway so this is the background of the person uh, exceptionally focused person tremendously focused person now he gave a talk on vedanta several years back i want to just make one point here so i heard the talk i was very impressed how from beginning to end of the talk for one hour it was one flow of thought one chain of argument. We often talk about many things. We get scattered, we go here and there. Just no wasted words, no distractions, no diversions, just one continuous argument from beginning to end. So I asked him, how do you do it? And uh, he said, well, in mathematics, that's how we are trained. You cannot do pure mathematics unless you take up one thought and follow it for hours and hours and days and days and weeks. You have to be absorbed in that one thought only. And I have seen him working you know, in, in mathematics. Uh, he is a pure mathematician. So sitting quietly, just looking at the board and sitting quietly. Another collaborator, mathematician from Australia had come. He was also sitting quietly and looking. So what are they doing? They're working. Just pure thinking. No computer, no phone not even a, a book, just sitting and thinking for hours and hours and hours on one topic. And at the end of it, one paper will be written maybe. So that is the power of, of continuous thought without distractions. That's what uh, Daniel Goldman says. So this is basically the essence of concentration. We all have that power, but yet, unless you protect it and nurture it, it will be lost. He says, one point he makes is that uh, this, there's a rhythm to our concentration. This is also worth learning. Often we cannot concentrate, not because we are not trying. It is because we are trying too much. Our brains, our minds are continuously engaged from morning till night. It is like as if I have hands, I have legs. Just because I've got hands, if I keep grabbing different things, uh, I will get tired. Just because I have legs, if I keep on walking around here and there without sitting down, I will get tired very soon. We never do that. That's, that's uh, insanity. But with our minds, we continuously do that. We are constantly thinking, not consciously, not deliberately, just mechanically, out, uh, habitually, our minds are churning on. They're going on and on with a variety of thoughts out of control. So what he recommends is, this is what we see in the lives of great spiritual teachers also. There is a 
the rhythm to our lives. And if you see the life of, say, Vivekananda, you see the life thousands of years ago, the Bhagavan Buddha, you see something similar. There is a period of engagement in Buddha's life. If you see the daily routine, he comes out, he teaches the uh, bhikshus, he meets the visitors, he's engaged in transmitting knowledge. But there are three, four times in a day when he withdraws completely away from people, away from the monks also to sit under a tree and go into deep meditation. Swami Vivekananda, as you mentioned, he was here in the World Parliament of Religions. And by the way, this Vedanta Society where I am, it is the first one. It was established by Swami Vivekananda himself in 1894. When he was here in New York uh, more than 125 years ago, 130 years ago, uh, he the people who saw him, they noticed it. I was just reading yesterday uh, the reminiscences of Cornelia Conger, who was a little girl in Chicago uh, when Swami Vivekananda came and he stayed in their house with, with her grandfather and grandmother. And she was a little girl. So she would run up and talk to Swamiji and Swami Vivekananda would tell her stories about India, all those things she remembers. But she also remembers at times he would be unapproachable. He would sit quietly in meditation and that, that such an such a aura of seriousness and depth that we would be afraid to appro approach him. Here, there are, there are nice accounts of Swami Vivekananda here in New York. Uh, how every now and then he would be quiet, sitting, sitting quietly in his room, absolutely absorbed in words, in deep meditation. So this rhythm of external engagement and withdrawal. Meditation is a very good thing. Or it could simply be take a walk in nature or just sit quietly. Not what we normally do for relaxation. This is an important point. This, this problem was not there in Swami Vivekananda this time. What nowadays, a lot of people, not only students, especially students, but also others. What is relaxation? Oh, I'm browsing on the internet. But what is this browsing? What are you doing? I don't know. Going from one thing to another thing. Very damaging for our concentration. It, incul it, it instills a very bad habit in the mind. Why is it so uh, attractive? Why is it so easy? Because it mimics the natural movement of the mind. The natural movement of the mind is to go from one thought to another. So I am reading something, then it reminds me of something else. And that reminds me of some work that I have to do. That reminds me of another person. Then some worry comes back or some hope, expectation comes and my mind has gone off. Now, mind goes from one thing to another, jumps from one link to another. This, um, uh, the internet, the way we browse in the internet is exactly like that. It goes from one link to another and it mimics the movement, the scattered movement of the mind. That's why it's so, so easy to get lost in that. So this is one thing that when you relax, when you withdraw from engagement, it is better to sit quietly in meditation, do a little pranayama, let's sit quietly, maybe repeat a mantra, or just take a walk in nature, or just listen to a, uh, music, change the occupation, what you're doing, change it to something more relaxing, something which makes you more introverted. Then, one more point, which uh, Daniel Goleman has mentioned, is that um, he mentions Walter Michel's marshmallow experiment. This is something I referred to sometimes. He was this uh, psychologist in 1960s here in the USA, Walter Michel, who conducted a very interesting experiment on young children, four-year-old, five-year-old children. Uh, what he did was he gave them marshmallows. That means it's like a sweet here. Um, and he told the little child that, would you want to eat it? And all the children said, yes. Now, and each child was taken separately. I will give you one marshmallow, but do you want two? And the children said, yes, we want two. Then you keep this marshmallow. I'm going out for some work. I will come back in a few minutes. If you don't eat it, it is in front of you. If you don't eat it, I will give you one more. Then you'll have two. You can eat two then. But if you eat it, then this one only. Then you will not get a second one. So will you wait? All the children said, yes, we will wait. Then the psychologist leaves the room. By the way, the original experiment of Walter Michel, you cannot see, but Zim, Philip Zimbardo, who is a very well-known well psychologist whose textbooks are studied in psychology classes everywhere, he repeated this experiment. And that experiment you can see on uh, YouTube. If you Google marshmallow experiment, uh, it's recorded. So the video recording is there of the children. 
when the psychologist leaves the room, the children are sitting with that sweet, their marshmallow. And then you can see the reaction of the children. All the children are attracted to it. They want to eat it. But two responses are there. Some of them simply eat it. They cannot wait anymore. Though they said we will wait, but we can't wait. They cannot wait. They eat it. And of course, they don't get a second marshmallow. Other children are attracted to it, but somehow they control themselves and they don't, don't eat it. And then the psychologist comes back. It's difficult for a child to find a sweet in front. And God knows when that the gentleman will come back. 10, 15 minutes is a long time for a little child to wait. Yes, but they waited, some children. Now, the interesting thing is Walter Michel made, divided the two groups. He did not tell the children anything, just on paper. He divided the two groups and he followed their career for the next 15 years till they went to college, these children. And he went back and talked to the parents and the teachers and the children. And he found a huge difference, a huge difference in the success in education, in studies, in co-curricular activities, in personality development. In all of them, just this small difference in self-control, small difference in self-control, those children who are able to control themselves, they are on the average, uh, their uh, SAT scores in America, they talk about this SAT examinations and all, were much higher. Uh, their success in academic uh, uh, sub subjects was much better. The co-curricular activities, sports, learning, music, all these things, they, are, they, they demonstrated persistence. They took up something and held on to it and completed it. The other group of children, the same problem followed them throughout their lives. That, that inability to resist impulse, poor impulse control. So something comes up, they, were, they, they start doing. Suppose a child takes up learning music, playing violin or something like that. It's difficult. It takes long hours of practice to master it. Now, many children enter and every teacher knows music or sports or anything that many will drop out many start many drop out only a few remain so after when it becomes boring difficult some dis nice distraction comes many children drop it and go elsewhere so the difference between success and failure in academic life it was clearly shown is a matter of self-control now what does this have to do with concentration daniel goldman points out that this ability that some children had to notice the distraction when it comes and to disengage from it. So I have to wait and not eat the sweet. The sweet is in front of me and attracting me. Notice that and not engage with it, disengage with it. And to resist that distraction again and again, not allow one's attention to be taken away there and keep one's attention on the future goal. What is the future goal? I will get two marshmallows. To keep the attention there and not to be distracted by the present distraction. What our modern social media does uh, is that it offers continuous distraction. And our attention is pulled into it, just like the little child who takes up the marshmallow and eats it. Though he had agreed, he or she had agreed, I will not eat it. But because the distraction is so powerful in front, shining, and our attention goes away from the future goal and comes here. See, the child wants two marshmallows. The child wants to complete learning violin. The child wants to complete the assignment. But at present, this is so attractive. Mm, that marshmallow or the phone call is coming from my friend or some chat is coming or some um, Facebook post is there. It is so attractive and immediate, our attention goes there. Studies have shown once your attention is diverted, for even once, just doing something seriously, your assignment or your office work, if you divert your attention, it may be just for a few seconds. What an amazing and, and rather horrifying thing that has been shown by studies is that it takes on the average 20 minutes to get back full concentration again. What a huge price to pay for just looking at the phone once. 20 minutes, your concentration will be less. You cannot fully focus again. It may take up to 20 minutes, of course, uh, to get your concentration back again. Um, Recently, I was reading this interesting work done by Cal Newport. He talks about something called deep work. The success in this, he says, in this internet age is that quality is the predictor of success. So on YouTube, for example, you will see that one song gets millions of views 
and the others get only a few thousand maybe. One lecture uh, gets hundreds of thousands of views, other one gets maybe a thousand views. Now, is your song thousand times better than the other songs? Is your lecture a thousand times better than the other lecture? It cannot be. Um, but then how is it that everybody is getting very little and only one person is getting so many views? The reason is this, the psychology of this modern internet age is, if you are offered one high quality product and many average or low quality products, everybody will select that high quality product, mostly. 99% will go there. Earlier, what happened when the information was not so widely available and freely available and uh, equally available across the world, we would select whatever was available. I would go to my bookshop and select whatever book selection that was given by um, the my local bookshop. Whereas now Amazon is there. You can select whatever is available. And if New York Times recommends this is the best seller, Everybody wants to read that best bestseller only, and not the second best, third best. So what has happened, fortunately or unfortunately, in this new world is, if your work is even a little better than others, you will grab the whole market. Everybody will go to you. It may not be thousand times better. So to make yourself a little better than everybody else, it requires that power of concentration. It requires that, that focus. So this is some, a reality about our new world, which we must realize. Um, one more point I would like to make. A lot of work has been done on what concentration is and how we can increase concentration. Recently, uh, in this branch of psychology called positive psychology. So there is a psychologist, Mihai Chiksen Mihai, uh, who has dedicated his life to the study of attention, to the study of how we focus, how we get, we get concentration. His basic insight is this. Actually, our power of attention is limited. We say the mind has unlimited power. He says, no, 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 just the opposite. We have limited power only. What, uh, and he quantifies it. He says, at any moment, moment, our attention has only a limited bandwidth. He says it is 110 bits per second, approximately. That's the amount of information. Bits means the computer science uh, bit of information. So at any given second, we can consciously um, process only 110 bits of information per second. Now that might seem to be a lot, but it is not. Uh, for example, he says, just to process the words of one person who's speaking to us. So I'm speaking to you. If you are attending to me, if you're listening to what I'm saying and trying to understand, you are using up about half of the available cognitive bandwidth. He says around 60 bits per second it requires to listen to a person and understand what the speaker is saying. That's why if two people speak to us at the same time, we do not have enough cognitive bandwidth to understand both at the same time. You see, it becomes very irritating. If somebody is speaking to you, another person starts speaking to you, you become very uh, upset. It's very difficult to concentrate and focus and understand anything. It's because it goes beyond our uh, limit, bandwidth limit. Now, here is the key insight from Mihai Chiks and Mihai. What is concentration? He says this 110 bits per second, which is available to you, how much of that we can take and focus on one subject? That is concentration. So out of 110 bits per second, can I take 70, 80? Little bit will be left over for just being aware of oneself. Can I take 80, 90 or 100 bits per second and focus it on my uh, object of concentration. So I'm studying a book, a chapter in a book. How much of 110 bits per second is concentrated there? If I'm not interested and bored, uh, what will happen is maybe 30, 40 bits per second is there. But what happens is the excess cognitive capacity which is left over, and this is crucial, the excess cognitive capacity which is left over, that is not being used. So anything in the environment that pulls your attention, that, that excess will go there and you will be distracted. A noise is there, um, TV is there, phone is ringing or phone is giving a little beep or ting, immediately mind goes there. Uh, and that is distraction. So um, when a person, child says, a child is not uh, interested in studying, is fidgeting, is bored, no concentration is there because 
the only a little bit of the cognitive capacity of the child is there on that book and maybe 60% 70% is left over and continuously distracted by things in the environment those children who are concentrating they're giving 80 90% of the total capacity on the object and the external environment is not making a difference to it it is no bandwidth left over for loss of focus you're holding on to that focus every child especially children have actually a power of tremendous focus notice when the favorite cartoon or favorite tv program is there how much focus is there for hour after hour the child will sit there and look so ability to focus is there it's only not under our voluntary control so i mean vivekananda says that if i had to do my education all over again i would develop the power of attachment and detachment the power to focus my mind at will and then to detach it and put it on another subject like that so this is a key idea um, that we get from mihai jigs and mihai and he gives us this idea that how do you develop so what what is this power of concentration very important idea is that when we are concentrated deeply concentrated you are using 80 90 percent of your focus the cognitive ability to do something read a book write something whatever it is it is actually a very pleasurable feeling it is a very enjoyable feeling concentration focus is not boring it is enjoyable not only it makes you more productive more effective it is also very enjoyable he calls it flow and he's written a book about it called flow which is a very important book in this whole literature on attention and concentration he says the quality of my life it depends on how much concentration i have and what i concentrate on how much concentration and what i concentrate on that makes all the difference to the quality of my life i read about the case of this lady who wrote another book on concentration uh, she says that she got cancer and then um, chemotherapy and so very miserable um, you know physical illness the effects of uh, chemotherapy the financial worries about all the expensive treatment so her life became hellish and miserable then she decided no i am a writer i will focus on my writing and give minimum attention to all these other problems these problems will go on so once she said that once she shifted her attention from her troubles cancer chemotherapy financial problem to writing and writing alone and minimum attention required for all the other things whole quality of my life changed she says because what i was concentrating on is it, am i concentrating on my problems or on my work my work is writing i'm concentrating more attention will be given to that by that what i concentrate on and how much i concentrate that makes the whole difference in my life so this is a very important insight and uh, mihai chiks and mihai gives this the crucial technique for improving concentration very deep insight he says there are these two factors one is challenge consider challenge to be uh, like a, a y axis and other one is skill consider skill to be the x axis now as our skill increases as the challenge in our life increases if something is more challenging and we are not skillful it will provide make you anxious and worried so there is an assignment for example for a student something you have to write and i don't know i have never done such a thing earlier i'll be worried my skill is less challenge is more worry skill is more you are very confident and challenge is less you get bored imagine when you are learning how to drive for the first time skill is less and challenge is more you are very concentrated and anxious and tense i should not hit or get hit by another vehicle when you are an expert driver after some time the same driving it is almost mechanical you then you can enjoy music or talk to another person and and drive automatically so the skill is more and challenge is less then now his crucial insight is when skill and challenge are equally balanced in between there is this thing called flow concentration what is concentration when the work that you are doing what activity that you are doing is very challenging and your skill is exactly equal to it not more or less so you are forced to use all of your power all of your focus 
all of your skill to accomplish that task, then you will be in flow, in concentration, full concentration. And that flow state is, is a very healthy state. It's a very beneficial state, very enjoyable state. Uh, I remember I was, um, I, I noticed how students in IIT Kanpur, uh, they worked in the library. I would, it, what, I would sit in the library and read and watch them sometimes. Same group of students come early in the morning, sitting there. Afternoon when I went, I, I went back to take my bath and I had lunch and came back. Same group of students still sitting there, seven, eight hours later. Uh, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, sitting and studying the same thing. Not one, many of them have the same capacity. I don't know, this is sad that we have not recognized that the crucial uh, factor uh, in education is the power of concentration. And we are not helping children to develop that. So students studying like that, I went to another engineering college many years later to give a talk to the students a private engineering college and well equipped uh, i mean all good facilities are there i went to the computer lab and it was empty uh, i asked the professor so uh, it's 5 30 are the students not there in the lab he said uh, oh, chale gaye. they have gone to um, out you know it is open if they want they can come but nobody's coming so when i went and talked to the students i said see the difference you see iit kanpur and you is not that wo IIT hai, ye utna hai, aisa nahi hai. These are the same kind of facilities. It's not a difference in teachers so much. It's not even that wo log zyada intelligent hai, hum log intelligent nahi hai. Not at all that also. There's only one difference. And the difference is how persistent those students are and how persistent you are not. The one difference. Same computer, same kind of laboratory. Maybe your laboratory is more latest equipment is there, more shiny and uh, it is empty. And I can guarantee you at 5.30, if you go to the lab in, the, in the IIT Kanpur, it will be full. Now, what is the difference? The difference is that the ability to hold on to one task and go on hour after hour to do it. And the interesting thing is, you may think, oh, kitna boring hai. It is not boring. It is not troublesome. As Mihai Chikzenmi has pointed out, concentration is very enjoyable. Ek cheez ko ke, you throw out everything else in your life and hold on to it for hour after hour, you will see the joy and satisfaction you get. So this active engagement in one task, the psychologist says that, see, if you passively do something, like passively consuming, you're sitting in front of TV or, uh, or internet and watching hour after hour, two, three hours, at the end of it, you feel disturbed. You feel disintegrated. You feel your mind is lower than it was earlier. But the same thing, suppose some sports is there. If you actually go out and play that game instead of watching it on TV, at, at the end of one or two hours, you feel energized, you feel happy. So any kind of active engagement, concentration is actually better for you psychologically, more enjoyable, more uh, satisfying at the end of that activity, you will be happier, more engaged uh, and uh, more fulfilled. You will feel more integrated uh, inside. Um, people say, I spent, um, I wasted, wasted so many hours browsing on internet. How do you feel after that? Very bad. I feel bad. Yeah. So one cartoon it, uh, I saw yesterday, it is there that one man is walking. Uh, there's it's written goal of life it's walking towards goal of life from behind another uh, cartoon comes it's written netflix movie it is coming and catching that man and taking him away <laughs> so away from the goal of life so you feel good when you're concentrating on something and then moving forward it is more enjoyable i told the students who the students and i saw in the iit kanpur library working for seven eight nine hours sitting with the same book uh, same assignment they are not bored. They are actually more happy than you are. This is the trick. We feel bad ke padhai karna, mehnat karna, it is mehnat we put it, you know, it's hard work, boring. No, it is actually enjoyable. It is actually fulfilling. Uh, it is actually you end up being integrated at a better level psychologically than you were when you started. So this is one more insight from Mihai Chiks and Mihai. Um, Swami Vivekananda, if you see the logo he designed for the Ramakrishna mission, 
um, if you remember, there is a serpent, like a snake, surrounding the whole thing like this. It's there. In between, there is a swam. There is the waters, wavy waters. One sunrise and lotus is there. Of course, we know the meaning for yogas. Uh, the lotus symbolizes bhakti yoga. The water symbolizes karma yoga. The sun rising symbolizes jnana yoga. And the snake symbolizes concentration, raja yoga. And the swan is the paramahamsa, that we, you reach the goal, you reach God realization, you realize your paramatma by a combination of work and meditation and devotion and knowledge. Four yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, raja yoga. But I want to concentrate on that raja yoga, the snake. Notice, that is the symbol for concentration. Three things are there. What are the three things? One is, the snake is constant, when it, when it is, say, focusing on its prey, a mouse or a frog, how intense its concentration is. Intense focus on one thing, that's number one. Number two, what does the snake do? You see that the hood, the hood of the snake is expanded. So as if, by expanding the hood of the snake, what is the snake doing? As if it is cutting out all distractions. Now, I'm saying as if, because any biologist or expert on snakes will point out that it's actually doing that as an intimidation tactic. You know, it's a part of the intimidation of the snake. But you can imagine like this, that it is cutting out all distractions. It is saying, no, one aspect of concentration is to focus on one thing. The second aspect of concentration is to cut out everything else. If you do not cut out other things, then they will come and interfere with your concentration. So nothing else, no friends, no mobile phone. By the way, I gave you the example of Mahan Maharaj, the mathematician, the monk who is a mathematician. One of the persons, yeah. leading cutting edge mathematician, topology, working on string theory. One of the persons who is least interested in a mobile phone, computer. It, I think he has no mobile phone also. Even if he has a mobile phone, you will never be able to reach him because he does not answer. It's permanently. When he wants to use it, he switches it on and makes a call. Otherwise, off. And this is something I've seen in uh, monks, in uh, scholars, those who are seriously interested in doing some work. They cut themselves off from computer, social media, and all of that. So uh, that's an uh, interesting aspect. That ability to... Second aspect is like the snake and the hood. Cutting off things. Have you seen how little children study sometimes? When they're very focused, they will do like this. They study like this. <laughs> yes. What are they doing? They're cutting out the world. Only this thing. I'm focusing on one thing. He need not do like this, but mentally we should be like that. Everything else, no. So that's the second aspect. The snake is like that, cutting out the whole world. The third aspect of concentration is the snake holds on that focus for a long time. Holding on the focus for a long time. So three things are there. One is focus on one thing. Second is cut, it, cut out everything else. Third is hold that focus. Hold that focus. Daniel Goleman in his book, Focus, he has dwelt a lot on meditation. See, both Mihai Sikzun Mihai and Daniel Goleman in their books, Mihai Sikzun Mihai in his book, Flow, Daniel Goleman in his book, Focus, they have dwelt for a long time on meditation. Um, Mihai Sikzun Mihai says, the best methodology to attain flow. I have studied the literature across the world on attention in all different cultures. The best one I found is the manual on meditation written by Patanjali, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Uh, two pages he goes on describing the Patanjali Yoga Sutra in his book Flow. Daniel Goleman also spent some time uh, talking about the different stages of meditation and the neuroscience behind it. He says, when anyone tries to meditate, what happens is you take up one object of meditation. In whichever tradition of meditation is basically training of attention. All meditation techniques are training of attention. Whether you are repeating a mantra, whether you are following the breath, whether you are visualizing a deity or the chakras, whatever you are doing or you are using a Vedantic approach to um, take any experience and become aware of the witness or whatever you are doing, it is basically training the attention. Now, there he says, when you train the attention, it will go through these stages. First of all, you will pick up something to focus on. 
maybe a mantra or maybe your breath. Then second, what will happen? Some distraction will come. Always, some distraction will come. Some thought will come, some sensation will come. And the mind will go there. Not only go there, from there to something else. And it will mind will start wandering. Then third, what will happen is, you will notice, oh, I have to repeat the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya or something. Or I have to follow the breath, breathing in, breathing out. Now my mind has gone elsewhere. So I must now bring it back to the object of focus and hold it there. So these are the stages. Bhagavad Gita also. Krishna says, you concentrate on the Atman, then yato yato manas nischarati. Uh, that wherever the mind goes, tatas tata niyam from there you notice it and bring it back. And then again, put it on the, on the object of concentration. The interesting thing that, that Daniel Goldman adds is, he says, the latest neuroscience shows that each of the stages has its own neuronal activity in the brain. When you select something to focus, one set of neurons fires. When there is a distraction, another set of neurons is firing. When the mind is wandering, the, there are other neurons which are active. When you notice that the mind is wandering, another set of neurons becomes active. When you consciously withdraw the mind from those distractions and bring it back to the object of concentration, another set of neurons is firing. So the whole process, which is described in Bhagavad Gita, for example, in Patanjali Yoga Sutras or in Buddhist meditation uh, manuals, uh, it is actually based on firm neuroscience. They noticed these are different processes in the brain. Selecting, distraction, wandering, Noticing that the mind is wandering and then bringing it back. As we repeat meditation, daily we do that, the mind becomes trained in noticing the distraction and in bringing the mind back from distraction and focusing on the object of concentration. So repetition, like a mental jib, it trains the mind. So this is one more thing, that uh, regular meditation, it, it improves the power of concentration. It enables you to notice Distraction enables you to consciously bring the mind back from distraction and focus on the object of concentration and enables you to hold on to the focus of concentration. <clears throat> One more powerful idea from Swami Vivekananda about concentration, how to get uh, powerful concentration. We know Swami Vivekananda himself, the extraordinary powers of concentration. So many stories are there. In Belur Mat, when he's sitting, he's reading his disciple Sharad Chandra comes and sees Encyclopedia Britannica. Not today like you see in DVD or in a website, but those actual books, heavy leather bound books. So at that time it was 10 volumes. And Sharad Chandra said to Swami Vivekananda, oh, so many fat books, it, one human being cannot read in one's lifetime. Swami Vivekananda said, oh, what are you saying? I have finished nine volumes. I'm on the 10th. Ask me anything from any of those volumes. And Sharad Chandra actually took up the challenge. He picks up this volume and that volume randomly opens pages and says to Swami Vivekananda, tell me what is there on this subject. And Swamiji replied to all the questions, including sometimes the same language down to the comma and full stop. Sharad Chandra was stunned. How is this possible? And Swami Vivekananda says, is by the power of concentration and Brahmacharya, he says, it is possible. Power of concentration, Brahmacharya. He's, uh, in another place, Swami Vivekananda said, the purer the mind, the easier it is to concentrate. The more you have purified the mind, the easier it is to concentrate. Now, one may not get that encyclopedia reading and memorizing power, but definitely, as we make efforts at concentrating, you'll find wherever we are, whatever is our level, definitely improvement will be there. Whatever is our age, whatever is our condition in life, health, um, occupation, our power of concentration will improve if we uh, follow these methods, especially meditation. And Swami Vivekananda gives a very powerful method. He says, simple and powerful. Do whatever you are doing with the fullest possible attention. Not just meditation, not just studying. At whatever time, whatever you are doing, you may even be gossiping on mobile phone with your friend, but do it with the fullest possible attention. Why? He says, Remember you, it is the same mind. We have only one mind. We have only one mind. One Swami in uh, uh, Satya Rupanji in Raipur Ramakrishna Mission, he, a very senior Swami, he gave a very nice example. He was telling students, 
कि आप तो आपके पापा तो दाढ़ी बनाते होंगे एंड ही सेड योर फादर शेव्स सो इफ यू टेक द शेविंग ब्लेड ऑफ योर फादर उससे आप पेंसिल चिल्लना शुरू कर दे इफ यू स्टार्ट शार्पनिंग योर पेंसिल वॉट विल हैपन द स्टूडेंट सेड इट विल बिकम ब्लंट विल योर फादर बी एबल टू शेव नो वाई बिकॉज इट हेज बिकम ब्लंट similarly we have only one mind now if throughout the day i scatter it jo bhi karna hai karo whatever it takes its fancy uh, especially the internet gives me full scope to scatter anywhere i like then when the time comes for concentration now i have to do this assignment i have to do this work the mind will not concentrate it has become habituated to being scattered so rather swami vivekananda says do whatever you are doing with the fullest possible attention intense focus take up this 20 minute 25 minute chunk of time in this 25 minutes nothing else will enter enter you give yourself time for a break after 25 minutes 5 minute break will be there tell the mind you relax do whatever you want again 25 minutes at that time make up consciously nothing else will enter intense burst of concentration far more productive than 2 3 hours of little work little distraction little gossip little uh, facebook uh, that kind of uh, it will not be productive at all so do whatever you are doing with the fullest possible attention just the opposite of multitasking so today we are so used to uh, i am doing my assignment i am talking to my friend once in a while i am checking my mobile phone for messages and facebook posts multitasking that is very bad that that is harmful for concentration time magazine in fact had a full page full cover story on multitasking and the conclusion was everybody concluded um, that multitasking is not good for our mental health or even for our productivity swami vivekananda says that do whatever you are doing with the fullest possible attention i have noticed these monks um, scholars good students uh, who have got this tremendous power of concentration in their other activities also they are very concentrated in their other day to day activities if they are talking to you they will pay full attention and not for long if you bore them they will go away but as long as they are listening to you they listen very carefully i have seen that yeah. um i have seen professors in top institutes i ask a question they remember my question every exact word to word they have listened so carefully they can quote my question back to me i cannot quote back what i asked maybe but they know exactly what about okay. so th- they give the tremendous attention even for a short span of time do whatever you are doing with the fullest possible attention remember we have only one mind last word and i'll finish i have talked only about concentration but in swami vivekananda's philosophy of education it is only one aspect it is not enough um ravana also had tremendous concentration the demons in our mythology are people who had great concentration but were not good people so just concentration itself is not enough to uh, be a blessing to our life to make us helpful for ourselves and for society uh swami vivekananda gave great stress on unselfishness let our life not be limited to only to myself what i do it should be a blessing to others in my community in my society for humanity at large um so the more you stand for something which is for lot of people not just yourself more you stand not for the individual but for the community uh, the more um successful you will be for your own sake and for others not just the power of concentration but the power of unselfishness i would say power of unselfishness is greater and bigger and more beneficial than even the power of concentration both should go hand in hand okay so that's what i wanted to speak about this morning thank you so much i think i have uh, taken a one full hour